This is a re-upload of this video. The original video was put out a few months ago and unfortunately I used a piece of software in that video that's called NeoProgrammer. It has since come to my attention that NeoProgrammer contains a virus and so I wanted to put this disclaimer at the start of the video. I am going to leave in the part of the video where I use NeoProgrammer because as far as I'm aware there's currently no other piece of software out there that would allow you to program ENE Super IO chips with the CH341A. And it does work, NeoProgrammer does do the job all right, with the exception of infecting your computer. So yeah, it is absolutely imperative that you only run NeoProgrammer inside of a virtualized environment where it cannot affect your computer. You can create a virtual machine specifically for using NeoProgrammer and doing stuff with it and nothing else. I am pretty sure it is possible to implement support for the ENE Super IO chips into something like SNANDER, but I can't be bothered to figure out how to do that. Maybe I'll get around to it, but probably not. So for now, the best way I know of to do this is to just use NeoProgrammer, but inside of a virtual machine so it cannot infect your computer. If you have a better way to do this, make sure you leave that in the comments so other people can use that method instead. So with that out of the way, let's move on to the video. All right, in this video, I'm gonna be talking about how you can program one of these ENE KB90 Super IO chips with the CH341A programmer. Before we get into it, I'd like to talk about the programmer. You're probably aware of the Volt mod that exists for these guys and I highly recommend that you do it before you perform any of this. Without the Volt mod, the data lines on this guy are going to be at 5 volts, which in most cases is not going to damage your chip because there is very little current on the data lines, somewhere around 50 to 100 microamps if I remember correctly. So when you connect a chip to it, because the current isn't high enough to sustain 5 volts, the voltage on the data lines gets loaded down to about 3.4 volts or so. But with that being said, I'm pretty sure that in the long run, you're going to end up with a burned chip if you don't do the volt mod. So I highly recommend you do it just to be safe. And it really doesn't take much time at all. All you have to do is lift the VCC pin of the CH341A off of the pad that's supplying it with 5 volts and connect it to the output of the 3.3 volts regulator instead. And you also have to connect pin 9 of the CH341A to the output of the regulator as well. Although you don't have to lift pin 9, you only have to do that for the VCC pad. So to program these guys, I recommend that you first solder the new Super IO chip on the board. You can do this directly with the Super IO chip, but the pins on this guy are really tiny. So it's better to solder it on the board and program it using the keyboard connector instead. It's a lot easier to solder there. And putting the chip on the board will also give you the opportunity to just give it a try and see if the motherboard is automatically programming the Super IO chip, in which case you don't have to do any of this at all. So we're going to be using Neo Programmer for this. And in here, we have a lot of schematics. And uh, this is the one we're looking for. This is how everything is going to connect. This should work for the KB901 series and the KB9022. Personally, I'm using the KB9012. Right here are all the pin numbers of the Super IO. Pin 42 needs to be connected to ground, and then you can connect the ground to the CH341A. I believe this needs to be pulled down to ground to put the chip in program mode or something like that. I'm not sure though. The rest of the pins are the SPI connections. So here's the board view for my motherboard and this is the Super IO chip. This makes things a lot easier. You can just find the pin you're looking for, let's say KSO3, and you can immediately find out where that pin is located on the keyboard connector. And you have these convenient ground pads at the sides. You can connect KSO3 over to there, and then from there, you can connect ground to the CH341A. And you can find all of the other pins and hook them up accordingly. 
Now, if you don't have a board view or schematic for the laptop you're working on, you can use your multimeter in continuity mode. Put one probe on the pin you're looking for and slide the other probe across on the pins of the keyboard connector until something beeps and you can find all the pins that way. As for powering the chip, you can do this with the laptop adapter. But in my case, I don't have a functional 3.3 volt rail. So I found this convenient spot where plus 3 volt EC is located and I can hook up 3.3 volts of the CH341A over here. And that will power the Super IO chip. So I'm doing this on the LA9901P motherboard. This one is from a Lenovo G500S. And the connections on the keyboard connector look something like this for me. But they're going to be different if you have a different motherboard. And if you're going to be using the multimeter method to figure out where the pins of the Super I.O. are located on the keyboard connector, something that might be helpful are these indicator lines all around the Super I.O. These basically help you keep track of the pin number. So this is pin 1 of the chip, and as you can see, there's a short line at pin 5, then a longer one at pin 10, then a short one again at pin 15, and a longer one at pin 20. So you have these long lines on multiples of 10 and shorter ones on multiples of 5. And I also had similar lines on the keyboard connector. I don't know how common this is on motherboards though, but this was really helpful design on the manufacturer's part, at least on the one I have. All right, I've connected the CH341A to my computer. Let's spin up the Windows Virtual Machine and see what we have. Now, if you're doing this for the first time, you're going to have the CH341A show up as an unknown device or something like that. So you're going to have to go into the drivers included with the Neo Programmer and install this guy. Once you have it installed, it's going to show up like this. And just for your information, I don't vouch for the safety of any of the software. I'm doing all of this inside of a virtual machine. And I have a firewall blocking internet access for all of this. I don't know if this driver and Neo Programmer are 100% safe to run on a real computer. So it's always better to err on the side of caution and virtualize this stuff. All right, with the driver installed, let's start up Neo Programmer. And in here, the first thing you need to do is go into Options, Detection Options, and Enable KB90 Detection. Once that is enabled, you can go here to detect the chip. And as you can see, my KB9012 shows up just fine. I'm going to select it. And now we need to select the firmware that we want to upload to the Super IO chip. In my case, it was pretty simple finding the firmware. I just had to head over to a search engine and look up LA9901P BIOS plus EC download. And you can use a similar search term to look up a firmware for your specific motherboard. And I'll share all of the files I'm using in this video in the description in case you have the same motherboard. So I'm going to head over to open file. And right here I have the firmware for my specific motherboard. Once that is open, all you have to do is head over here. Make sure that you've selected erase, blank check, write, and verify. Once all of those are selected, you can click on the write button. Select yes. And there we go.
Absolutely. Alright, that's done. It didn't take very long at all. I've seen for some people it takes a really long time. I'm not exactly sure why that is, but at least for me it only took about 5-6 to six minutes to do this. So it's perfectly viable for professional use, and you don't have to buy any of those overpriced programmers if this is all you're looking to do. And at the end of the day, all we've done is communicate with the chip using the SPI protocol. It should be possible to do this with STM32 boards, and even Arduino should be capable of doing this. And some of these insanely overpriced programmers literally use the exact same microcontroller that you would find on an Arduino. So it's really only the closed source software that you're paying for when you buy one of these, which is really unfortunate. I wish this stuff was open source so it would be more accessible to everyday people, but it is what it is. Anyways, I'll stop rambling. Hope this video was informative and I'll see you in the next one.